Royal and noble. Serial killers. Male. Kill one man and you are a murderer. Kill millions of men and you are a conqueror. Through most of history, royals and nobles held a place high above the peasant class. Their word was law, and they could often get away with murder. Literally. So much unchecked power sometimes went to a ruler's head, morphing their darker urges into unspeakable acts of violence and cruelty. The lives of peasants were given very little value, and there were few means to investigate or seek justice against murderous aristocrats. High-born psychopaths were nearly unstoppable in their bloodlust, and often racked up victim counts in the hundreds. Let's investigate the cases of four royal and noble serial killers from history and look at the theories that one of the most famous slashers of all time, Jack the Ripper, was really a member of the British royal family. Lu Pangli, Prince of Jidon, 144 to 116 BCE. Pangli was the grandson of Emperor Wen and nephew of Emperor Jing, rulers of China during the Han Dynasty. When Pengli was a child, his father rebelled against his grandfather and assassinated a minister. He was banished and his vast estate divided between his five sons. Prince Pengli became a rich young man and he grew up arrogant and cruel. He gathered a band of 20 to 30 young men, some of whom were enslaved, who shared his streak of savagery. Together, they marauded the countryside, robbing and killing people for sport. Confirmed victims of the prince's gang exceed 100 people. The slayings were known across China, and people were afraid to leave their homes at night. Eventually, the son of one of Pingli's victims made an accusation to the emperor, and his counselors advised him that he must execute the prince but the emperor could not bear to have his own nephew killed. Pingli was instead demoted to a commoner and banished to the countryside. Once the prince was out of power and his entourage executed, the killing spree was brought to an end. But it is not known what became of Pingli or if his demotion put an end to his debauchery. Du Shanatir, Himyarite king, 5th century CE. Du Shanatir took control of the Himyarite kingdom in modern day Yemen and ruled there for 27 years. He was known as the man with earrings. He most likely took the throne by means of violence as he was not a member of the royal family. Once in power, he took to luring young boys to his palace with promises of food and money. Once he had them in his grasp, he would strip them, rape them, and throw them out the window to their deaths. One night, Shanatir lured a Jewish prince named Nuas to his home. But before the king could attack, the boy pulled out a knife and stabbed the murderer to death. Du Shanatir's severed head was displayed from the palace window, and his intended victim, Du Nawas, took power as the new king. Gilles de Rey, Baron Durette, 1405 to 1440. Gilles was born in Anjou, France, into a noble family. He was orphaned young and inherited the title Baron Durette. The 100 Years War between England and France had been raging for 68 years, and many generations grew up surrounded by violence and death. Gilles grew into a talented soldier. At 15, he and his grandfather rescued Duke Jean VI of Brittany, who had been kidnapped by the enemy. 
In thanks, the Duke rewarded Gilles with land grants making him rich beyond his wildest dreams. And the hand of wealthy heiress, Catherine de Troyes. The young baron was now one of the wealthiest men in France, and he joined the entourage of King Charles VII. Around this time, another ambitious upstart appeared at the French court, Joan of Arc. She was a 17-year-old peasant who boldly requested an audience with the king. She told an incredible tale of being visited by Archangel Michael, who instructed her to take command of the French army and defeat the English. Gilles served as Joan's right-hand man, and in just nine days, they freed the city of Orléans from siege. Joan and Gilles were national heroes, and both played prominent roles in King Charles's long-postponed coronation. Joan was later captured by the English and burned at the stake as a witch at the age of 19. Gilles retired from military service in his 30s and returned to Brittany. He had money to burn and became consumed by his hobby, writing and producing a theatrical spectacular of his own many victories. His play consisted of more than 20,000 lines of verse, requiring 140 speaking parts, 500 extras, and 600 costumes. On opening night, he laid out a massive free feast for the audience, assuring everyone in town attended. The peasants enjoyed the jobs and free food and cheered for the baron but his family and in-laws were horrified that he was burning through wealth they had painstakingly accumulated over generations. Next, Gilles began the expensive construction of his own personal chapel. The Duke of Brittany asked the Pope to deny the application to have the chapel consecrated. When Gilles learned he would not be getting a priest, he ordered extravagant holy robes and performed mass himself. This was outright blasphemy, and the family could stand it no more. They went to the king and requested that he stop Gilles from selling any more land. The duke took control of Gilles' property and left him bankrupt. The baron traveled to one of the castles he had owned, which was being occupied by a priest. He beat and kidnapped the clergyman and retook the castle. The assault prompted an investigation by the Bishop of Nantes, and the Duke of Brittany was all too happy to cooperate. According to court documents from the investigation, Gilles had spent the last several years experimenting with alchemy and the occult. Together with an Italian cleric, Francois Pellati, rumored to be his gay lover, Gilles attempted to summon a demon who could create gold out of thin air. The pair attempted the spell three times, but no demon appeared. Francois then informed Gilles that in order for the incantation to work, a child would need to be sacrificed. Gilles' bodyguard, Henriette, confessed that the Baron frequently abducted children whose parents were all too happy to see their offspring become a servant to a great nobleman. Gilles would dress the child up in fine clothes and serve them a feast and copious amounts of alcohol. Next, the child would be taken upstairs, where they would be sexually abused and then have their throats slit. The bodyguard said Gilles took pleasure in the children's agony and would hold up the most attractive of his victims' heads for his dinner guests to admire. The remains were burnt in the fireplace, the ashes and bones thrown into the moat. The court believed the number of Gilles' victims to be more than 140, but perhaps as many as 600, mostly boys. Potieu and Henrette were both arrested and confessed under torture. Several parents came forward claiming their missing children must have been the Baron's victims. 
Gilles himself was brought into court, and when threatened with torture and excommunication, he confessed to the crimes. Gilles and his accomplices were hanged, the gallows set on fire, and their bodies consumed by the flames, as they were all convicted witches. Gilles de Ray is believed to be the inspiration for the French folktale Bluebeard, about a wealthy man who marries poor young girls and murders them on their wedding night. But in recent years, historians have been re-examining the case, and many believe Gilles was in fact the victim of a witch hunt, and that none of the terrible crimes he was accused of actually happened. Several of his friends approached the court, saying that they had never seen any evidence of child abuse or murder, but were ignored. No bodies or even bone fragments were found on Gilles' property. All the evidence against him was brought by the Duke of Brittany and other nobles, who stood to profit from Gilles' death. After the execution, his land and property was given to the Duke, who split it up among his family and gave a generous donation to the church. Evidence was recently uncovered that Gilles' body was not actually burned, but was buried in the church of Notre Dame de Carme, strongly suggesting that the church didn't really believe the Baron was guilty of witchcraft and murder. Sado, Crown Prince of Joson, 1757-1762 Yi Son was the second son of King Yeonjo of Joseon, modern-day Korea. His mother, Yeong, was one of the king's many consorts. At the age of 10, the prince suffered a severe illness which caused him frequent fainting spells. He survived while his older brother died. Thus, Yi Son became heir to the throne. When he was 15, his father began training him to become king but he found constant fault with his son and frequently chastised him, humiliating him before the court and especially in front of ladies-in-waiting. Yi's son grew into a nervous man with severe anxiety, especially in his father's presence. He formed a close bond with his sister, Princess Hao Yop, who was also a frequent recipient of their father's abuse. She died when they were both teenagers, and Yi Son was intensely bereft. The prince took a secondary consort against his father's wishes. She became pregnant, and he was so afraid of the king's wrath that he forced the consort to take abortive medicines. The child was born healthy, and the consort raised him away from the palace. When Yi Son was 22, his adoptive mother and wife both died within a month of each other. He had been close to both women, and their deaths led to a breakdown in his mental health and relationship with his father. Shortly after the queen's funeral, the prince walked into his chambers holding the severed head of a eunuch he had killed in a rage. He forced his wife and ladies-in-waiting to look at it. After this, he frequently beat and killed palace staff and raped ladies-in-waiting to release his frustration and rage. He is believed to have murdered over 100 people. The prince developed a phobia of thunder and of clothing. Each day, he would call for 30 sets of clothes to be laid out before him. He would burn some to appease ghosts and have great difficulty at selecting which outfit to wear. If he did, manage to pick an ensemble, and his servants made the slightest error in dressing him, they would be beaten or even killed. Yi Sun took another consort, Bing Ah, who had been a lady-in-waiting to his grandmother and was therefore off-limits to him. His father berated him, and he attempted suicide by jumping down a well, but he was pulled out. 
At his 25th birthday party, the prince verbally lashed out at his father, mother, and his own children, and threatened to slash his sister with a sword. He hit his wife in the face with a Go game board and beat his consort Bing Ah to death. Consort Yung feared for the lives of Yi Sun's children, her own grandchildren. She begged the king to deal with their murderous son, but it was against the law to shed the blood of a member of the royal family. And if Yi Sun were convicted of a crime, his son, the king's only other male line descendant, would have to be disinherited and banished. As a solution, the king ordered Yi Sun into a rice chest. The prince begged for his life and tried to escape, but the chest was tied closed with ropes and left outside in the hot July sun. The prince continued to respond from inside the chest for seven days. On the eighth day, he was silent. The chest was open and the prince was declared dead. King Yeonjo restored his dead son to the position of crown prince so that his grandson could someday become King Joanjo. Yi Sun was given the posthumous name Prince Sado, meaning thinking of with great sorrow. Was Jack the Ripper really a royal? In Victorian London, in the squalid alleyways and backrooms of Whitechapel, the gory corpses of a series of brutalized sex workers were discovered. Their throats were slit before their internal organs were removed. The surgical nature of the slayings led police to suspect that the killer had some medical training and was possibly a gentleman. It was common for upper-class Victorian men who were expected to live a life of virtue to sneak away to the seedier parts of London by night. There they could fulfill their secret fantasies at the many brothels where destitute sex workers were willing to do nearly anything for a shilling. In the midst of the murders, London was ablaze with paranoia. But after five women lost their lives, the killings stopped. Scotland Yard followed the trail and even received letters from someone claiming to be Jack the Ripper. But the identity of the killer was never uncovered. One of the most intriguing theories is that the malicious murderer may actually have been a member of the British royal family, Prince Albert Victor, the future king of the United Kingdom. He was the eldest son of the Prince of Wales and the grandson of the reigning monarch, Queen Victoria. Albert Victor, known as Eddie, was born second in line to the throne and was expected to someday become king. But those who knew him didn't relish the prospect. The prince was not very intelligent and suffered learning disabilities. He disappointed his tutors, and when he attended Cambridge, as royals do, lecturers thought that there was little point to him being there. Even his fiancée wrote that he was self-indulgent and as aimless as a goldfish in a crystal bowl. Eddie was, however, kind, affable, and good-looking. He was beginning to gain a reputation as a playboy, much like his father, who famously had 50 mistresses. He was even involved in a terrible scandal in his lifetime. In 1889, one year after the Ripper murders, a 15-year-old telegraph boy was stopped by police and found to have 14 shillings in his possession. Believing the money was stolen, the officers interrogated the boy. He admitted that he had earned the money by having sex with men at a male brothel on Cleveland Street. He gave a list of clients, which included many high-ranking members of the government and aristocracy. At the time, homosexual acts were illegal in the UK, and men faced imprisonment and social ostracism if accused. Scotland Yard investigated the brothel and confirmed many high-profile clients, including Lord Arthur Somerset. He was an equerry to the Prince of Wales and a friend of Eddie's. 
he fled the country before facing prosecution. But the police were warned that if they continued digging an incredibly high-profile person by the initials P.A.V. would be implicated. They did back down, and only a handful of aristocratic suspects got light sentences. There is no real evidence that the prince was a client at Cleveland Street, only speculation and rumor. Prince Eddie died in 1892 at the age of 28 during an influenza pandemic. His younger brother George took his place in the line of succession, and at the altar, he married Eddie's fiancée, Princess Mary of Tack, and became King George V in 1910. Albert Victor's scandalous reputation in life and early death have made him a character of some fascination and mystery. In 1970, Dr. Thomas Stowell published an article in The Criminologist, in which he claimed Prince Eddie was really Jack the Ripper. His premise was that Eddie had contracted syphilis during his time as a naval cadet in the West Indies, and that the infection had driven him insane. He harbored deep hatred for the sex workers who had infected him and transferred his rage to the women working in London. According to Stowell, the royal family knew Eddie was a murderer, definitely after the second murder, Annie Chapman, and possibly even after the first, Marianne Nichols but did nothing to stop him until the double slayings of Elizabeth Stride and Catherine Eddowes, after which the prince was taken away to a private mental hospital. Eddie escaped to kill his final victim, Mary Jane Kelly, after which he was again locked away and died, not of flu, but of syphilis, at a private mental ward on the Royal Sandringham Estate. Stowell's theory set the Ripperology world ablaze, and with so many other royal and noble serial killers of the past who really did victimize the lower classes with impunity, it seems plausible. But there are a few glaring holes in the case. Most importantly, the royal family took meticulous notes on the whereabouts of its members. And on the occasions of all five murders, Prince Eddie was far away from London or out of the country. Stowell claimed as his primary source the private papers of the prince's doctor, Sir William Gull, but these supposed incriminating papers were never found. Still, the idea of Eddie being involved in the killings sparked the imagination of other ripperologists. Another theory proposed that Eddie had been taking painting lessons from famous artist Walter Stickert. While at his studio, the prince became enamored with the artist's model, Annie Crook, who was a Catholic. Annie became pregnant, and she and Eddie were secretly married. The couple and their daughter Alice lived together happily until Queen Victoria found out. She was outraged and ordered a stop to it. Annie was taken to an asylum where Dr. Gull performed experiments on her and drove her insane. But baby Alice was rescued by her mother's friend, Mary Jane Kelly, who deposited her safely at a convent. Mary shared the prince's secret with four of her sex worker friends, and the ring decided to blackmail the royal family. That's when Dr. Gull murdered the five women to keep them quiet. This theory has been the basis for a number of books and dramas, including the 2001 Johnny Depp movie, From Hell. And it does hold an echo of truth. Queen Victoria's uncles, King George IV and King William IV, really did have secret marriages to low-born women while they were still princes. George's wife, Maria Fitzherbert, was a Catholic, and marrying her should have legally barred the prince from the throne, but the union was annulled and covered up. 
Prince William had no less than 10 children with his actress wife, Dorothea Bland, which might have caused a succession scandal, but the marriage was also annulled and covered up. It's easy to imagine that with the scandals in Victoria's family history and her resulting prudishness, she might have ordered extreme lengths to cover up similar misdeeds among her own descendants. But again, there is no hard evidence for any parts of this theory or any other connecting Prince Albert Victor to Jack the Ripper. Though dozens of potential rippers have been proposed, his identity remains a mystery. In next week's episode, we'll meet five female royal and noble serial killers from the past. A Sri Lankan queen who crowned her lovers and then offed them to make room for the next. Elizabeth Bathory, the famous blood countess of Hungary who tortured and killed hundreds of servant girls and a French Marquess whose experiments with poisons sparked a witch hunt, which burned ladies all the way up to the king's mistress. Want even more tea on history? Check out the History Tea Time podcast, available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and Google Podcasts. Don't want to wait to see the next episode? Patrons get exclusive early access to almost all of my multi-part series on Patreon early. If you would like to become a patron and help me make more fascinating history videos, check out the link in the description. Thank you for watching.